get started now. Um, good evening, everyone. As the Science Day comes closer, we at the Science Lab of Eyes of Pune are coming in with great vigor and we are extremely excited to welcome you all to our final part of our talk series, Hues of Chaos, today. Today, Professor M.S. Santanam, who is a professor in physics at Eyes of Pune, will take you into the world of chaos and physics. Professor, we gladly welcome you to the talk. Hello. Hi. Good evening. Good evening, Professor. So, Professor Santanam is a professor of physics uh, at Eyes of Pune, and his research interests broadly cover the areas of chaos and nonlinear dynamics, quantum chaos, quantum computation and machine learning, statistical physics, complex networks, extreme events, and complex systems. Specifically, the problems range from um, driven quantum systems and random metrics theory to random walks and extreme events on networks and data science. We are extremely uh, eager to hear from him. Uh, Professor, the stage is all yours. Okay. Thank you for inviting me on this occasion. Uh, let me share my screen. And thanks for the kind introduction as well. Okay, I guess you are able to see my screen, right? Yes, basically. Okay. Um, just a second. Yeah. Fine. Um, uh, unfortunately, today uh, I have to give this talk from a tab, so I won't be able to use a pointer and I won't be able to see any questions in the chat box. Uh, if you have any questions, you can just unmute and ask me or uh, maybe you can ask me at the end. Either of them is fine. Uh, the topic was actually not selected by me. It was given by the Science Club, Chaos in Physics, and I have added the subtitle Newton to uh, Lawrence. Uh, the title is somewhat ambitious. Uh, it's like saying, you know, talk about symmetry in physics or uh, something of that kind. Uh, and I guess that uh, there are many uh, students from first year to uh, fifth year in the audience. So the talk is really not, not for the experts. And it's also somewhat uh, will be historical in nature, plus just trying to give you an idea of chaos in uh, physics, uh, sort of overview rather than giving you a lot more uh, mathematical equations and so on. In fact, there's just one slide with somewhat non-trivial equations, but otherwise it's only pictures. You can sit back and uh, uh, enjoy. So in the title, uh, you will see that there are uh, two sort of technical terms. If you, if you are a lay person, for instance, because all of you are trained in science at some level, but nevertheless, there are these two terms, uh, chaos and uh, physics. Uh, of course, physics, everyone has some idea of what it is, but even uh, the word chaos, I thought first I should maybe just start with the dictionary meaning of uh, chaos, but it's actually not necessary because when you say something is chaos, chaotic, you sort of tend to associate it with uh, something that's not regular. So everyone has some idea of what uh, chaos is. It's like they say that, for instance, everyone knows what time is until you ask them to define it. Same thing I would say of chaos. Everyone knows what is chaos when they see one, but uh, it's hard to define. And in fact, I'm not even going to define chaos in this, uh, in this entire talk. It's somewhat uh, technical. It's meant for the nonlinear dynamics uh, courses, but we'll see all the various things about uh, chaos. Uh, since I said that everyone has some idea of uh, chaos, I guess that's really everyone, including uh, I hopefully some of you uh, are his fans, uh, Mahindra Singh Dhoni. Uh, I just picked up from one of his uh, statements that Dhoni says that managing chaos is key to win. No one asks Dhoni, you know, what did you mean by chaos and what is your definition of chaos? When such a thing appears, we all assume that we know what is chaos and so does uh, uh, India's captain then, uh, Mahindra, Mahindra Singh uh, Dhoni. So in that sense, everyone has some idea of uh, uh, what is uh, uh, what chaos is all about. It's not just 
uh, this thing alone. We see the word chaos being used in several contexts. If you just go through some of the headlines in uh, newspapers, you would see that uh, the idea of chaos keeps coming up again and again in various contexts. Pretty much all our state at assemblies, you know, I've just put some two, one from Tamil Nadu and one from Uttar Pradesh, but be rest assured that I'm not targeting either of these states, but it's, it's a common phenomenon in all the state assemblies. We do have um, some or the other chaotic scenes happening, even in, in the elders house, Rajya Sabha. And of course, for instance, there is an opinion article here that says Indian roads are uh, chaotic and so on. So again, here you already have at the back of your mind some idea of uh, what chaos is when you read uh, news items uh, like this. Uh, so often we tend to associate um, you know, chaos with something that's unruly and not regular, which is at some level uh, correct. And as it happens, when you look at the affairs of daily life, uh, it will appear to us that human life is often chaotic. You walk into the roads, you see chaotic traffic and things don't work as planned and so on. But actually it doesn't work like that with nature. Things work far more precisely. In fact, very precisely like a clockwork. You, you look at days and nights. Suddenly the days and nights don't change their duration, nor the occurrence of seasons phases of moon, appearance of comets, seasonality of uh, crops growing. No, you can't just sow anything at any time and hope that it will grow and you can harvest. Or uh, tides in the sea and so on. These are just some of the natural phenomena. So the thing with this is that, so if you are, let's say someone living about 2000, 2500 years ago or even earlier, you know, these are the various things you would have seen. You may not have seen a chaos in assembly or Raja Sabha, but you would have seen all these things, days and nights, starry nights like this, for instance. And if you are very careful observing the skies, you would have seen the various patterns of um, uh, astronomical uh, phenomena happening. And they are perfectly regular. There is no reason to believe that there is anything, uh, anything like irregularity can be associated with any of these uh, phenomena. So in a sense, on one hand, your human life might look chaotic, but your nature, which you observe all around you, is fairly regular. So this has been sort of internalized in our uh, thinking for the last uh, maybe 2000 uh, years or so. So we believe that everything has to work regularly because pretty much most of these macroscopic phenomena do show uh, uh, regularity because this is the night sky. And there are very specific uh, instances. Like for instance, these are the things which anyone can see. You don't need any uh, special thing to, uh, I mean, watch the days and nights go by, for example. On the other hand, there are very detailed observations of eclipse cycles. Uh, some of you may already know it and probably know better than me, this uh, thing called the Saros uh, cycle, an 18 year eclipse cycle. So the cycle basically repeats itself at approximately about uh, 18 years. It's not exactly 18 years, but at an approximate time frame of 18 years. So you can see in this figure, for instance, this line, lowest line that you see, a low line, which is marked 1937. So that was one of the eclipses that happened in 1937. And again, in 1955, the line got shifted in the same latitude. And then again in 1970. At any given time, there are about 40 odd sorrow cycles uh, um, which are uh, essentially uh, taking place. Here I picked up this from uh, Wikipedia uh, article. Uh, for example, the, the first, uh, for instance, they have given numbers to the sorrow cycle. For instance, 131st cycle. This is the lunar eclipse cycle. Started in 1427, May 10. The last one is expected to happen in 2,707. So you can see uh, the kind of uh, time frame that it covers. Each sorrow cycle covers about 1,200 uh, years or so, approximately. And this one was figured out not now, but 
almost uh, 2300 to 2400 years ago. Babylonians were the first one to figure out that there is this larger regularity in the appearance of cycles. At that time, there was no great communication that they could actually go from one place to another and observe eclipses and then come to this conclusion. Quite remarkably, looking at lunar eclipse uh, data, they were not only able to come up with this uh, large-scale uh, regularity, but also they had a, what today you would call as an analog computing device. It's called Antikythera mechanism. It's actually a hardware device, a mechanical device, which will predict eclipses. Apparently it was built around 100 BC and uh, there was a shipwreck. Uh, and of course it went down with the ship and it was discovered in 1902 or maybe 1899, about uh, 120 uh, years back or so. And now people have reconstructed this mechanism in a, uh, using the same kind of uh, idea. Okay. So people were able to predict eclipses almost like 2,300 years uh, ago, thanks to someone being able to observe minutely these uh, cycles. And of course, Ptolemy was one of them who knew how to uh, predict, and so uh, did many other uh, civilizations. And Ptolemy, of course, had uh, much more to his uh, credit. Uh, so the, the point I want to emphasize here is the fact that there is so much of regularity in nature, not only at the very broad level of uh, seasons, days and nights and uh, so on, but also when you look at some details like these, these are more uh, detailed regularity that uh, can be uh, observed. And Ptolemy, in fact, came up with these uh, tables with which he was able to compute the uh, positions of suns and I mean sun and uh, the other planets, and was able to even predict the uh, eclipses. Uh, so he actually did quite a bit of detailed study of the motion of sun, earth, and other planets. Almagest is, of course, his authoritative uh, text, and it continued to be an authoritative text in spite of the fact that he got some things. Uh, incorrect. Uh, the text happened to be very authoritative for several uh, centuries. And Aryabhata in uh, 475 uh, here uh, in India uh, was a mathematician and an astronomer. He wrote this book Aryabhatian. Okay. So he his contributions were largely in trigonometry, you know, there are many things like quadratic equations and so on, uh, sines, value of pi and so on. Uh, but he also gave the very first uh, scientific explanation for uh, how uh, eclipses uh, occur. He didn't go very far into predicting the eclipses, but at least he came up with the, uh, with the answer to the question, why do we see uh, solar and uh, lunar uh, eclipse? So once again, all this points out to large, uh, at a very macroscopic scale, you have uh, regularity. And when you have regularity at macroscopic scales, at the scales which you can observe, then you can come up with uh, some uh, laws which you can uh, hopefully uh, use mathematical equations to uh, write them. For example, everyone would have studied about the Kepler's uh, laws of uh, motion. And how did he do it? So he actually took over the data which was actually observed by Tycho Brahe for almost 15 to 20 years. So he Tycho Brahe observed it for almost 15 to 20 years. And, um, and uh, before he could actually start analyzing the data, he passed away. And um, uh, Kepler uh, became his assistant just before he passed away and he inherited this huge volume of data. Today it will be called data science, but essentially what he did was to pour over the data for several years and he condensed them into those three uh, statements, three laws for which, uh, I mean, which we call the Kepler's uh, laws of motions. So they were some of the precise uh, uh, calculations done uh, before the computer uh, age. And it was all uh, laborious and arithmetic uh, calculations. You have to keep checking again and again. You can imagine nowadays we don't even do it. We either use computer or 
calculator, but imagine that everything has to be uh, calculated, every multiplication, division, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, behind all this effort is, again, the idea that things are regular, so perfectly regular that you can actually, uh, by observation of data, you can uh, condense them into some uh, laws and hope to even predict them. If that were not true, it would be, uh, I mean, useless. If it were just a stochastic or a random process, there is no point in uh, observing and trying to predict because each time you're going to come up with a different realization and you may not be possibly able to predict anything. And the sort of pinnacle of all this is uh, Newton's contribution, uh, the Newton's loss of uh, motion. Once again, uh, the idea behind that is that things are quite regular. There is no uh, sort of stochastic component to uh, any of these things. And his laws of motion were universal in the sense that it applies or applied as much to falling apples uh, uh, to, to the uh, motion of the uh, planets as well. You could actually, you would have seen this kind of equation, one way of writing uh, Newton's second law, that force is equal to mass times uh, acceleration, which is taught in uh, school level. But behind this, there are uh, several uh, important assumptions which are generally never uh, stated. Most important is that the assumption that the universe is deterministic, meaning that uh, if you write it in, uh, uh, in, in, in the form of a differential equation, you will say that uh, F is mass times acceleration. So, and you, you would say that X is uh, displacement. So it is D square X by DT square. I'm not able to write it here, but uh, I guess all of you know accelerations, d square x by uh, dt square. So you have a differential equation, and this differential equation is a deterministic differential equation, meaning that uh, you can write a determ, uh, you can write this, uh, sorry, you can write this um, um, uh, differential equation, an ordinary differential equation for any potential, and the equation will not contain any stochastic terms. It will not contain any random uh, terms. So if you're modeling your universe as a form in the form of de deterministic set of equations, then one of the assumptions that goes behind it is that you assume that everything uh, in the universe happens in some deterministic way. There are no sudden surprises. There can't be something uh, very irregular happening. And uh, the second assumption is that initial conditions are uh, crucial. So you take an initial condition and solve this equation. Newton's second law, basically, you can think of it as an algorithm. And you take that algorithm. I have my system and I have the initial condition. Now you simply run the algorithm, which is solve the, the differential equation. And you will get the position as a function of time, maybe the momenta as a function of time. So given an initial condition, you can get, you can predict the future perfectly. There's no problem about it. And given the initial condition, not only you can predict the future, but you can also predict all the past. So in other words, fixing an initial condition essentially fixes everything. Knowing initial condition along with Newton's second law is equivalent to saying that I know everything about its past. I know everything about its future. There is nothing left to be known, which is equivalent to saying that anything can be predicted. So I have the operating algorithm, which is the Newton's equations of motion. And the only thing I need to choose is where is my particle starting from and with what, uh, say, velocity. With this information, I can predict uh, everything. So these are the sort of canonical um, uh, uh, premise on which the entire uh, structure of New Newtonian physics is based. And this idea actually continued to rule our thinking for almost two, three hundred uh, years. And you can see that where this idea has come from. It just come from the fact that you know, everything that you ever observe uh, in uh, nature is pretty much regular. 
and you can't even imagine trying to model such a universe which works like clockwork precision using uh, terms in your differential equation which would uh, be uh, something random or uh, stochastic in nature uh, in fact the whole idea that i'm trying to convey is uh, very well conveyed by in fact conveyed much better by uh, laplace uh, all of you i guess must have studied some or the other uh, things discovered by laplace laplace transform being uh, famous one uh, he says that for instance uh, an intelligence which could comprehend all the forces by which nature is animated and the respective situation of beings uh, who compose it an intelligence sufficiently vast to submit these data to analysis for it nothing would be uncertain and the future as the past would be present to its eyes so all it says is what i said before that uh, given all the initial conditions and given your equations of motion there is nothing that is left to be known i mean you know everything about it past as well as the uh, present and in fact this uh, word uh, intelligence uh, nowadays people call it laplace demon there is something called a maxwell demon um, which is related to a very different uh, phenomenon but uh, this such an intelligent um, uh, let's say a person uh, is called a laplace uh, demon so this is in some sense a consensus idea till about 1890s or even a little bit uh, later so all that laplace was doing was simply to uh reflect a fairly uh, well accepted idea at that time well accepted within the community of uh, scientists uh, at that time but all this uh, changed uh, with the entry of uh, henry poincare and i should say something about uh, poincare as a person a very remarkable person you know, often we say someone is a multifaceted personality or a polymath if there was a polymath a real polymath he is really one of them he was a mathematician and a physicist combined into uh, one he studied mathematics actually he studied both he studied mathematics and he had a degree in mining and in fact he was the uh, if i remember he was the chief in mining inspector of france uh, almost till his death so he didn't give up his job even though he was spending quite a lot of time doing mathematics and physics he was also doing uh, let's say another more formal job as a chief inspector or uh, chief miner in uh, france and of course his contributions are just far uh, too many uh, in mathematics and uh, physics so i'll not even uh, get into that so as i said he never left his engineering career either for mathematics or physics somehow uh, he was able to continue all of them together and in 1889 uh, he won this prize uh, which was given by the king oscar ii of uh, sweden and this prize was uh, related to what is uh, called the three body problem and that is where we the first seeds of uh, chaos began to appear uh, let me explain this a bit uh, before we go to three body problem we need to know what is a two body problem okay you should uh, maybe uh, know what is a one body problem i mean i i guess if you um, either attempted to write one of these entrance exams you would know that uh, the questions are full of one body problems you know the particle sliding down uh, some incline or something of that kind what happens to its velocity acceleration those kinds of stuff so all that is a one body problem um, in some uh, force field slightly non trivial is a two body problem so you have two bodies which are interacting again um, in some force field but of particular interest is this gravitational interaction so you can think of for instance the sun uh, and the earth so there are two bodies here m1 and m2 are their masses and they are separated by a distance r and this is today a textbook 
uh, problem. Um, you will see this uh, in all classical mechanics uh, textbooks. The solution is fully given. And what I have written here, V12 as a function of R is just the gravitational potential. So this is an exactly uh, solvable problem. There's no, uh, there's, there are no issues about it. No, in no way can you say that there is anything irregular about it. Uh, so in some regime of this two body problem, you will see that you will get circular orbits. Um, there are other kinds of orbits also possible. Again, there is a catalog of what can happen in a two body problem. Uh, you can see the textbooks uh, in any classical mechanics textbooks. On the other hand, if you go to three body problem, now you just don't have two bodies, but you have three bodies. So I have this uh, yellow one, uh, blue and uh, some other color. So there are these three uh, bodies with the masses M1, M2 and M3. Okay. Now the again, they interact through a gravitational potential, okay, one by R potential or minus one by R potential. Uh, in which case you will have uh, uh, the potential which will look like this. It's a sum of three terms. But, uh, I mean two. Uh, e, I mean two bodies taken pairwise at a time. Okay. It turns out that this is not exactly solvable. So when I mean exactly solvable, you can write the function. I mean you can write the position and say the momenta as a function of time explicitly in some closed mathematical form. In that sense, this is not an exactly uh, solvable problem. So this uh, problem has a hoary uh, sort of history dating back to even Newton. Newton attempted a three body solution to the three body problem. So there are different uh, sorts of three body problem. You can assume that, uh, no, I have three bodies, but all of them in, a, in the same plane. The three body problem in the same plane is called a restricted three body problem. And that is exactly solvable. So there are a few such special cases of this three body problem, which are exactly solvable. But in its full generality, where you don't make any assumption about the three bodies, they could, they need not be in the same plane, they could be anywhere. Okay. And the only thing is that they, they all interact through gravitational interaction, such a three body problem has no exact solution. So right from Newton, pretty much every brilliant mathematician that you can name, uh, Lagrange, Euler, whoever, they have all uh, tried to solve this problem. It, um, it uh, did not lead to any uh, solution, close form uh, solutions, except for some one or two restricted uh, cases. Okay. So that was, that was the status until about uh, uh, 1890s. From 1700 to 1890s, no headway could be made to the general three body uh, problem. Okay. So again, it's the same thing. Now, if you can't solve three body problem, where is the hope of solving a n body problem? Like for example, the general question is much larger, not just that we want to solve a three body problem. So we were still thinking that, you know, uh, given the success of uh, Newton's laws, Kepler's laws, we thought that every problem can be solved. You have, you can solve two body problem, you can probably solve three body problem. But in general, the hope is that you can even solve the n body problem, n being any large number, it doesn't matter. You know? can even be 10 to 20 under the gravitational interaction. So that's in some sense the, uh, 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 the goal to be achieved. So here, for example, I have given you an example of, uh, okay, I couldn't, I can't draw a large N, but uh, I think it has seven uh, particles or seven bodies, if you like. And in fact, I have not even drawn all the possible lines. I've just drawn some of them. So you have to take pairwise. Uh, so in general, this would be the potential, uh, the one that I've written here with the summation. <clears throat> so the idea is that to be able to ultimately solve this n-body problem under gravitational interaction. So that was the setting in, uh, let's say, 1880s or 1890s. You could solve the two-body problem, three-body problem was not solvable. No one knows what happens to n-body problem. Uh, so at that time, um, in 1880s, um, early uh, or a little before that, I think 1882 or something like that, a journal called Acta Mathematica was uh, started uh, by uh, Carl Weierstrass. Uh, I think Carl Weierstrass, yeah. 
and he persuaded uh, uh, king of uh, no i think it was started by mitag leffler another prominent uh, uh, mathematician and uh, he was a sort of um, a close uh, uh, confidant of uh, the king of sweden and norway oscar ii and he was looking for ways to popularize his uh, journal acta mathematica so he persuaded the king to announce a prize uh, for celebrating his 60th birthday uh, so he said uh, you know we'll use this occasion to give a set of problems and whoever will solve this uh, problem successfully will give them a prize and the king agreed and uh, actually there were four different problems uh, set and one of the problems is what is written here given a system of arbitrarily many uh, mass points that attract each according to newton's law under the assumption that no two points ever collide try to find a representation of the coordinates of each point as a series in a variable that is some known function of time and for all of whose values the series converge uh, converges uniformly okay seems technical at first sight but in very uh, simple language it says that solve the n body problem under gravitational interaction so it says finally that you know give me the positions and the momenta as a function of time if you can't uh, you know solve it this way at least give me a, a infinite series representation which will converge uniform now that itself is sufficient to say that the problem has been solved and one of the interest in uh, you know why ask this question about n body problem you know, two body problem okay sun and earth maybe three body problem because sun earth and moon is there so we want to study so in general n body problem because you want to also know what happens to the solar system as a whole so you have sun and say nine planets uh, i mean if you add all the moons of all the planets it's even much bigger so in general you want to know the fate of the solar system that was one of the important mot motivations for studying uh, n body problem in general of course it is of uh, um, general interest right, to know whether a solution exists or not and uh, let me cut the story short here and directly uh, go to uh, 1889 uh, in 1889 poncre won the prize so as i said there were four problems actually Poincaré attempted this problem and he won the prize, but he did not solve the problem. Okay, that must be surprising. He didn't solve the problem. Then why was the prize given to him? Uh, let's understand a little bit. Uh, okay, so as I said, uh, there are no equations. Uh, uh, these two slides are the only one which have some uh, equations. Uh, I don't know how many of you have already seen Hamiltonians, um, but. Uh, Uh, think of it as some function that represents the energy of the system in case you don't know uh, what the hamiltonian is uh, so h is basically the hamiltonian representing uh, it's a sum of say the kinetic energy and potential energy so we are looking at systems which conserve uh, energy so it's a total of uh, kinetic and potential energy uh, is generally written as two parts one part which is h0 which is solvable uh, and other part which you can treat as perturbation for instance in a problem like this uh, you could say that i know to solve how to solve two body problem uh, maybe i'll treat the third body m3 uh, with mass m3 as a perturbation a small uh, addition to the two body problem and see if i can solve it because the assumption is that if it's a small perturbation it probably won't change the whole uh, solution by a, a big amount it will just make some small changes and hopefully i can do the calculations uh, that's the idea behind such perturbations and here the equation is written in terms of what is called the action and action angle variables again if you know what action angle variables is fine uh, i1 i2 are um, actions and theta1 theta2 are angle variables but otherwise think of it as some modified form of momenta and position uh what happens is that if you have to solve it in this in the perturbative sense or applying classical perturbation theory you have to actually do a transformation you have to go from one set of coordinates to another set of coordinates under the conditions that the new coordinates become constants of motion that's the key thing you know you should be able to extract constants of motion if you can extract constants of motion it's easy to solve that's the basic idea 
And it turns out that when you do this, uh, this is the kind of new uh, actions are this uh, script i and phi. And uh, okay, you get some uh, infinite series like this. Okay, don't worry about uh, everything that's there here, but uh, you can just focus on uh, one thing, uh, the denominator here. It has this L1 omega 1 plus L2 omega 2. So omega 1 and omega 2 are frequency of periodic motion of the two bodies. So it's a two-dimensional system. Uh, so there is a periodicity to the motion uh, and uh, omega 1 and omega 2 are the periodicities. Uh, so again, IE1 and phi1 are not exactly momenta and position. So these are actually modified action and uh, angle variables. Uh, again, if you don't know what it is, just think of it as some uh, moment on. The problem with this term is that this actually diverges whenever L1 omega 1 plus L2 omega 2 goes to zero. So the classical perturbation theory actually fails. Fails spectacularly in uh, obtaining perturbative uh, solutions. So wherever there are what are called resonances, these are indicative of resonances in the classical uh, system. There is some uh, time scale matching that goes on in uh, classical system. In fact, solar system has many resonances. So there, uh, these um, infinite, uh, these uh, series uh, diverge. What Poncare did is he showed that, um, you know, this, uh, this is a general property for N body system. And whenever you have this denominator going to zero, you call it nonlinear uh, resonance. I won't have time to, uh, it's a um, core idea of nonlinear physics. But uh, whenever it goes to zero, uh, something called nonlinear resonance is observed. But in effect, it also means that perturbation theory uh, won't work. So here is what Poincare did. Given that perturbation theory is not going to work, you can't answer the question the way they have posed. They have said, can you give me a perturbation theory that will converge? Okay, perturbation theory doesn't work. Now, what do you do? So you can say that, okay, I've tried your method. It's, it's not working. But what Poincare did was he went beyond this. So he Poincare showed that, of course, this is a generic property. Okay, generically, there are going to be nonlinear resonances in nonlinear potentials. So remember that minus one by our gravitational potential is a nonlinear potential. So it is going to have these nonlinear resonances and they are going to basically play havoc with your perturbative solutions. So instead of trying to find position and momenta as a function of time, which is what the detailed solution that you would like to have ideally. Okay. Ideally, I'd like to know position and momenta as a function of time, but given that I can't do that because these perturbative solutions are failing, Poincaré devised an entirely new geometric approach. So he said that, uh, you know, I'll do something like this. I'll look, at, uh, I'll look at the dynamics in a section. So here I have given you a, a very brief idea of what a section is. So this black line that you see here that's going round and round is, let's say, the trajectory of one of your bodies. Okay. Now what you do, this phase space is really a huge space in some sense. So if you have n bodies, uh, phase space will have two, uh, I mean, uh, two n dimensions, okay? uh, n position and n momenta. Now what you do is you put a, a screen somewhere in any arbitrary direction and just collect the points whenever the trajectory passes through that screen. So like these red points that you see here are the points that, that are left by the trajectory when it traverses across that uh, screen. So this section is today called a Poincaré section. Uh, there are more, uh, the, there's a strong uh, mathematical uh, grounding for this, but pictorially, this is what it is. Now you can throw away all your complicated dynamics of these black lines and only study these red dots on the section. Okay. So that's the very interesting device that Poincaré came up with. You know, study the red dots and see if you can actually say something about the question that was asked. So what he did is he studied, uh, he looked at these red dots and uh, looked at the stability of solutions around some of these uh, points. So what is needed is to answer the question whether uh, an n-body system is, an n-body system under gravitational potential is stable or not. 
one way is you find the full solution and then see whether they are stable or not other way is given that i can't uh, get the solution can i directly have access to stability properties that's what he did okay directly access the stability properties without knowing the detailed solutions so he applied this technique to the three body problem and showed that the dynamics is extremely complicated and no closed form solution is possible and when he used the word or something equivalent to this word complicated that is where the seeds of uh, chaos uh, remain and uh, so going back to the question as to why did he get the prize even though he didn't solve the problem you can see carl viestras's comment on it so there were like uh, some of the uh, iconic mathematicians who are the judges for that uh, prize uh, given by the king of sweden and the viestras's comment was that this work cannot indeed be considered as furnishing the complete solution of the question proposed so he says that you know this is not at all a solution to the question that was asked but that it is nevertheless of such importance that its publication will inaugurate a new era in the history of uh, classical uh, mechanics that is what uh, carl viestras had to say which is why uh, he got the prize and uh, okay so this is there were only nine figures in the 240 page uh, solution submitted by ponkare and the last of the figures was this one hand drawn uh, figures so i'm not going to even try to like uh, tell you what is the complication but uh, let me just use the words of ponkare himself Uh, let us attempt to have an idea of the figure formed by these two uh, curves and their intersections okay maybe let me first read it out and then uh, explain uh, which are infinite in number and each of which corresponds to a solution that's doubly asymptotic these intersections form a type of trellis tissue or grid with an infinitely dense mesh neither of the two curves must intersect itself but must fold over on itself in a very complex manner so as to intersect all of the meshes of the grid the complexity of this figure which i cannot even attempt to draw is uh, striking this is what ponkare said of the uh, figure this figure actually doesn't show you all the complexity of what he imagined only much later today books will show you the complexity of the figure actually what he was describing is what chaos uh, what we call as uh, chaos so this kind of situation happens in what are called um, unstable fixed points or more technically they are called hyperbolic uh, fixed points you see the point p here you know uh, so again here you are looking at the section because uh, ponkare studied this kind of section so you are seeing the dynamics on the section and if if uh, if the dynamics on the section is unstable you will have the uh, you will have this kind of uh, uh, picture universal a kind of two lines which are crossing each other but the approach to this is called um is uh, for systems like three body problem they have these oscillations these are called i mean i there are too many technical terms here uh, i'll not even maybe try to explain uh, all of them but you are going to have so many uh, oscillations which uh, accumulate uh, towards this point p almost an infinite number of oscillations that will accumulate here the problem is that they cannot cross each other because of the uniqueness of trajectories which is the basic property of all ordinary differential equations so they have to uh, they have to become longer and longer because they need to preserve some areas because they are conservative and they should also not cross so putting together all these constraints what you come up with is extremely complicated kind of dynamics so you see in this um, the last figure right hand lower uh, thing it's extremely uh, complicated around these unstable uh, fixed points uh, you can get a simple glimpse of it from a very uh, i mean it's hard to see uh, the 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 core idea in this uh, in this uh, figure but let me explain it with a much simpler system which is not chaotic this is as you can recognize is simply the uh, phase space for a pendulum and on the top you have the potential energy on the lower uh, graph you have the ponkare uh, sorry the uh, phase space itself uh, now you look at the red dot that i have put on the lower uh, thing look at any of the red dots so you have at the 
point at that point you have those two lines which are crossing perpendicular to one another that's an example of a unstable fixed point when you look at it from the point of the potential energy you are at the top of a hill so if you are at the top of a hill you let's say you imagine that on that hill you try to keep a ball uh, okay it's very hard because if you even slightly make a mistake it's, it will roll down in one of the directions okay so a small error that you commit on top of the hill will make the ball roll down either to the left completely or to the right compare it with the other case here uh, in the potential energy curve you look at this point zero it's at the trough here you don't need to take so much care about keeping a ball there because even if you are a little bit off it will finally come and settle there you know that's a stable uh, fixed point so this is a non chaotic system where you have a discrete collection of um hyperbolic points or uh, unstable uh, fixed points whereas in in a situation like this you have a discrete collection and as you jack up the non linearity in the system um all uh, hell uh, break loose breaks loose so essentially what happens here is uh, that you have a, a local instability of uh, motion uh, in fact the idea that uh, there is an exponential sensitivity to initial conditions all come from the fact that you have local instability when you try to like the picture i gave try to keep the ball on top of the hill because a small error will take you either to the minus infinity or to the plus infinity that's the rate at which error can uh, intensify grow here is what here is how a typical chaotic system phase space uh, would look like so this is a poincare section and i'll not uh, uh, maybe give you details of um, uh, what this uh, system is uh, but you can see that for some small value of parameter uh, the left side top uh, a um, panel a uh, in this figure is dominated by regular curves so there is no chaos there but as you keep jacking up uh, non linearity finally you come to the point uh, look at this figure f you see that you have a random collection of points that's an um, uh, that's an indicator that you know, your system is chaotic everywhere in phase space there are these uh, everywhere in phase space is unstable it's like imagine that you, know, you have a room full of people and you try to throw a extremely hot iron ball at people what happens at the what would be the dynamics of such a ball people down there would be afraid that they would be uh, burnt by the red hot iron ball so they would simply try to push it somewhere else you know at that point no one will see in which direction they are pushing it their only aim would be to push it somewhere else so the the dynamics of that ball would resemble something like uh, something like an irregular uh, motion or it will be a chaotic motion so everywhere it goes wherever it goes the ball sees that it can't remain there it has to go somewhere else that is what the local instability of motion is and when such a thing happens all across the phase space uh, you actually end up in a uh, in in chaos so at every point you have exponential uh, sensitivity now now that you follow these uh, ideas now you can go back and uh, revise your opinion about universe is it deterministic well okay you are still modeling uh, the physical systems using deterministic system of differential equations but the outcome is no more deterministic so the solutions are no more deterministic not for the three body problem not for the n body problem and initial conditions are crucial so as i said it depends on whether you are keeping the ball at the trough or at the point you know that's your initial condition where you keep matters and if you are keeping at the top even a small error can give you large uh, difference and uh, newtonian idea assume that anything can be predicted now it turns out that because of this exponential because of this sensitivity you cannot assume that everything and anything can be predicted so in general classical systems uh, cannot be predicted to arbitrary accuracy all the time and this 
would apply to solar system as well. So solar system is also unstable over uh, long time scales. And people have done numerical uh, simulation of uh, solar system. And it involves very interesting uh, new numerical techniques because you can't use the same, for instance, the Range Kutta method that you would uh, normally use to solve, uh, say, the, for the solar system. Um, you, you need to improvise. So I, I'll not get into it, but um, uh, there are what are called symplectic integrators. Uh, but if you do that, uh, basically the result says that uh, over long time scales of anywhere between two and 250 millions of years, um, possibly the solar system is unstable. It's not going to exist the way it exists today. I mean, there's no need to worry about it now for us, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a, it's a real, real long-term uh, expectation. Uh, maybe let me see if I can show you one simulation at this point. Mm -hmm. I hope you're able to see this. So this, as I said, is a three-body problem on a plane. So you see these nice... Uh, uh, Now let me show you, say, Sun, Earth, and Jupiter. This is simulation with real numbers put in. Okay, so it keeps going on. There's nothing unusual happens here. Uh, but let's look at a chaotic solution. For a different set of parameters. So. Okay, so you can see that uh, basically it becomes unstable and uh, uh, things just go out of you. So they sometimes come back, but uh, you can see that the kind of orbits they are tracing are completely uh, not regular. Okay, so, uh, so the lesson at this point is that three body problem is chaotic. It's known to be chaotic. And the end body problem in general uh, is uh, chaotic. And there have been in recent times very interesting um, machine learning based approach to three body problem. Again, it doesn't mean that you solved it exactly. It means that there's another approach which is numerical in nature, uh, which can um, also handle a three body uh, problem. So these are uh, interesting approaches. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but again, these are more recent uh, developments. I think I'm uh, running out of time, but let me uh, maybe just take three, four minutes, no more than that, uh, to say other things. So till now, I've been talking of core physics problem of you know, how to work with the you know, two body or three body problem. The important thing is that these are conserve. I mean, uh, these are uh, systems which conserve areas in phase space. Energy is one of them. But in general, it need not necessarily be energy. They must be, in general, preserving some kinds of areas in phase space. These are called conservative uh, systems. There's a whole class of dissipative systems, which means that you put in initial energy in the system. But as time goes by, the system basically loses energy and finally settles into something. Okay. And uh, so between uh, like 18, uh, 1900, uh, let's say 1899, when um, uh, Poincaré got his prize and already he said there is something very unusual in the three-body problem. Between then and 1960s, nothing much happened. No one immediately jumped onto the problem and started, uh, you know, we should search for chaos and all that. Nothing of that kind happened. It uh, was fairly uh, dormant for nearly uh, 60 years until uh, this MIT um, meteorologist, Edward Lawrence, um, he was actually not even uh, studying chaos. He was studying this three uh, coupled differential equations. You can see that x dot, y dot, and uh, z dot. So this is a model for convective uh, processes in that, a simplified model for convective process in the atmosphere. And what he realized was that uh, if uh, so, he actually the story goes that, for instance, he was uh, I mean, uh, simulating it on the computer. Those days, computers were far more primitive than the kind of computers we have today. The computer, even the powerful computer that Lawrence used in 1960s, early 60s, 
uh, is far less powerful than the mobile phone that we have today. So he tried with the initial condition, let's say one possible initial condition was this 0.506127. In order to save space and memory, he tried to cut the last three digits and he made it 0.506. He thought that nothing much will change. And he put it for simulation, came back after a few hours and looked at the solution. He found that the two solutions were very different. One that was started with 0.506127 and 0.506. They were like the schematic that is shown here. The first run was, let's say, this green curve. The second run was a, a red curve. This was not expected. Still, people had in mind that everything was deterministic. There shouldn't be major changes. But then that's what was happening here. You know, one was, it's like saying that one solution predicted rainfall, whereas the other predicted a sunny day, something like that. And later on, he called it the butterfly effect, in the sense that small uh, variations in your initial conditions can lead to major uh, changes. And in fact, you will see that here. So if you simulate a Lorentz system, uh, here is here are actually two solutions. Look at the lower panel. There, are, there is a black curve and a red curve. Until about time equal to about 18 or so, you can't differentiate the black and red curve. They are very close to one another. But as beyond that point, they diverge from each other. That's a sign of chaos. There's an exponential diverge. So here, which means that you, your input is not random. The equation looked very nice. No random input in the equations, but your output is random. Which is why you know, you're able to produce chaotic irregular solutions from deterministic equations, which is why it's called deterministic chaos. Not only uh, Lorentz model, which is a set of three differential equations. In fact, it leads to what are called strange attractors and so on. Again, I think I'm running out of time. So it is a fractal object. Again, um, an interesting stuff, but I think we are out of time. But you don't even need to go to differential equations. You can just take a math, a simple difference equation, which is like this. It's a simple one-dimensional difference equation. There's only one parameter A here. Small n is the time. So the value of uh, some value of x at time n plus one is determined by the value at n. So this is called a logistic map. So it's again a chaotic map. Nothing random in this difference equation, but the outcome is random. Uh, so you can, from 60s, this trend started and by 80s, 90s, we know that pretty much any uh, collection of uh, many bodies is chaotic. So we know that, for instance, hydrogen atom is exactly a solvable problem. You have a nucleus and electron. But if you put in one more electron, which you call the helium atom, and pretty much everything else bigger than a helium atom is all chaotic. And pretty much all many body systems in condensed matter physics is chaotic. And there are many examples of chaos in high energy phenomena, in many QCD models. I'm not the uh, best person to talk about it, but uh, I mean, they are uh, there for those interested in ecological sciences, in economy, stock markets. And there's a whole uh, branch of uh, synchronization in chaos. So you will see very interesting uh, videos of chaotic synchronization in YouTube. Um, and chaos can also be used for uh, cryptography. Uh, let me maybe, before I conclude, uh, let me just quickly go over the things. So what is chaos? One is it needs to show sensitivity to initial conditions, which means that if your initial conditions are close to one another, they would diverge exponentially. Initially, for some time, they will go very close to one another. There is a short time predictability, but not over long time, which is why, for instance, you can predict weather for maybe a week or so for five to seven days, but you can't predict weather for one year. You know, if I ask how it will be next year on this day, you can't ask, but you can ask questions about the average climate, but you can't ask questions about weather. You can't ask like, what will be the temperature uh, maybe two months later on this day. Uh, so small changes in initial conditions leads to major changes in the outcome. And important thing is that random systems will not show this property. You shouldn't equate chaos to just randomness. Chaos is not randomness. It has structure. It has a lot more structure than uh, just randomness is something like random numbers that you generate from your computer in one sense. Chaos is just not that. Visually, it looks like that, but it's it has much many more uh, properties. And uh, finally, uh, one interesting question is, given that you know, pretty much everything that we said is about 
chaos in classical system. The natural question appears, what happens to chaos in quantum system? Uh, I'll not even try to start that. It's a story for another day, another seminar in itself. And it's a work uh, in a field called quantum chaos, which started again in 1970s. But uh, the quick answer is that chaos leaves its trail in quantum regime as well. So recently, one of my friend did this work from IIT Kanpur. They use some of the chaotic properties to design a disinfection uh, chamber. Again, I think I, sh think I should uh, possibly uh, not go beyond this. Uh, so finally, the summary is that uh, chaos is um, uh, random motion, limits predictability, and it requires us to revise our opinions about deterministic nature of the universe. And chaos or chaotic dynamics is not a field of physics. It occurs everywhere. It's there in all the areas of physics, atomic molecular physics, nuclear physics, whichever uh, that you might want to pick. It has implications for um, uh, in uh, quantum uh, regime as well. Okay, I think I'll stop with this. If you have questions, I'll answer. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the wonderful uh, talk. It gave a lot of insight into what chaos is and its historical aspect. Uh, so before this, uh, we have one request to all of you here. Uh, if anybody could switch on their videos, because we would like to take a screenshot of everyone here. Um, so can any of you switch on your videos? Um, this is just a part of the online gathering thing. So, the second, let me just please. I think I got everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, now uh, we can move on to the Q and A session. Um, we have one question in the chat box here. So. Uh, the question from Deep Shah is, what is so special in the three-body problem that makes it difficult to solve? Uh, okay, so as I said, the difficulty is that if you take the traditional route of perturbations, the perturbation series diverges. Uh, yeah, okay, so physically, the why, why should uh, that happen? The reason is that there are resonances, basically. So there, are, there is some matching of time scales. You know, which leads to resonances and hence hence uh, there is a divergence of these uh, uh, perturbative series. So that's the physical reason. And uh, in general, if you take a nonlinear system where the frequencies of motion depend on the actions. So if you take a linear system, that doesn't happen. If you take a linear system like harmonic oscillator, the frequency does not depend on the action. On the other hand, you go to a nonlinear system, uh, frequencies depend on the action, in which case you will always see some or the other nonlinear resonances existing, in which case you are going to find that um, the, the usual perturbative solutions don't. Sir, uh, am I audible? Yeah, sir? Ah, yes. You're sir, is there any way to like quantify the coupling between two differential equation and then relate that to how the solution diverges from each other. Can we do that? Uh, see, coupling two differential equations is straightforward. You just need to couple them with some parameter. Uh, in principle, you can ask the question, what is the rate of divergence as a function of this coupling parameter? But there's no general yes. answer to that. Uh, it depends on the problem. Um, when you like wrote down the series, you wrote down two terms, omega one and omega two, and those are the angular frequencies of the two bodies. Like yeah. omega one, is it the angular frequency of body one when body two is stationary or is it just in the... So omega one and omega two are, okay, I didn't, I, I didn't want to make it complicated, but they are not constants. They depend on the action. Okay, so they are constantly evolving throughout the motion. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they depend on, so omega 1 depends on I1 and I2, omega 2 also depends on I1 and I2. Yeah.
yeah frequencies will be changing it's not a constant everywhere throughout the problem so we have a couple of questions in the chat box uh, yeah, from i'm not able to see that chat no box so you can yeah. read out yeah. sure sure uh, so sriram has asked what properties of a system can the poncker section give us okay so any uh, uh, okay Pong, uh, studying poncker section is completely equivalent to studying the full dynamics and so anything that you can derive from your full dynamics you can also derive from poncker section which is why it's a useful device. Um, so whatever you want to calculate any property, you could do either way. So in, in some uh, cases, Ponker, in very few cases, can Poncare section be analytically written down right? in some linear systems. In fact, in all linear systems, it can be written down, but in pretty much most of the nonlinear systems and chaotic systems, there is no analytical way of writing the Poncare section. Um, numerical uh, solutions is the only way out. But if you once you look at the Poincaré section, you get a global view of the whole system. You get where the system is um, uh, regular, where the system is chaotic. So when you say uh, generally the real physical systems are never completely chaotic or completely regular, they are a bit of mixture of both. So when you look at the full Poincaré section, you get an idea of in which region of phase space is it regular, in which region of phase space it is chaotic, all that information. you get. Getting that information from the full uh, trajectory is possible, but it's a lot more harder. That's okay, thank you. From Aditya, we have, can the chaos of a system ever decrease entropy? Uh, Chaos, uh, so chaos would correspond to some maximal entropy. Uh, uh, can it decrease entropy? Uh, not as far as I know. In some sense, it correspond to maximizing entropy. So uh, next we have from Anand. Uh, mm. So you mentioned chaos is more complicated and structured with mm. compared to randomness. Can you just explain a physical phenomenon to clarify the difference? Yeah, so uh, randomness is unstructured. There is no physical structure to it. It's like, as I said, uh, generating random numbers, you know, you, which you can do on your computer. But chaos is not like that. Even visually, it might look like it is random number, but it has periodic orbits in particular. So it has a chaotic system. In fact, one of the definitions of chaos is that it should have periodic orbits of all periods. Uh, so there are no periodic orbits in a random um, uh, realization of numbers or a stochastic system. But periodic, uh, but um, a chaotic system has periodic orbits of all periodicities. Uh, it has exponential sensitivity to initial conditions, which is also not there for random systems. In random system, you won't see an exponential sensitivity to initial conditions. So these are the additional structure that you will see in a, in a chaotic system, which differentiates it. But if you are just given a graph of a random system and a uh, and a chaotic system, they will look alike. In fact, it's hard to say which is, in fact, impossible to say which is random and which is. You need to do additional extra analysis to be able to do the differentiation. So uh, do we have any more questions here? Um, that's all in the chat box. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask. So I think um, that's all for the question answer session. Uh, thank you, Professor Santanam, for being a part of this um, event. Uh, I'm sure that sharing your expertise in the subject of chaos would be very enlightening to many of us here. It was interesting to see how you took a historical aspect and uh, we started from regularity and we slowly moved from regular to irregular and to see that evolve. Um, and we highly appreciate your presence here. Uh, also, we place our gratitude uh, to everyone who joined this session. Thank you for your active uh, participation. Additionally, we greatly appreciate um, Professor Sunil Mukhi and Professor Rajesh Nath 
group of flawlessly organizing this event along with all the science club coordinators and volunteers who made this event uh, you know run and the uh, all of us are here and enjoying the session. Uh, finally, thank you all for making this remarkable event possible. Uh, okay, I think that's it. Um, we'll end this session here. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor.